what I will say is, yes, he was remarkable, as I've said already. Uh, many people thought that he was Arahant, many lay people. To the Sangha, he would not actually uh, express that. And as a member of the Sangha, this is an area that which we would not actually talk about to public. Uh, Bhante himself, I think, would not say that he was an arahant, at least not to monks, not to lay people either. So, but it's an area, as I say, that he was a remarkable individual. But I would not like to say much more because that's an area which we cannot discuss properly as a monk. I was also asked what was Bhante's contribution as a as a monk or forest monk? Well, first of all, his learning, so remarkably learned. But this is learning which is just not learning in itself, it's learning for practice. And it's learning for practice using the Buddha's teaching and applying that learning for one's own development. And remember, Bhante was, was really inspired by the forest monks of old, the Arahants, as expressed by the verses in Terra Terigata. All these very old discourses, the verses in Sutta Nibhata, which praises monks living alone in the forest, living alone in the wilderness. Bhante was inspired by these teachings to develop himself. This was his inspiration as a monk. As a forest monk, he really lo wanted to live like a forest monk in Buddha's time, completely free, independent, living according to the, the monk's rules, but also this incredible freedom and independence that he had, living outside the walls of today's forest monasteries. Uh, another contribution is we find the teaching that wherever there are noble ones, we're not saying Bhante was a noble one, but wherever there are noble ones, whether they're living in the mountain or in the forest or wherever they may be, they are the inspiration for other monks, but also for lay people. Also the Buddha has praised living in seclusion. If monks are prepared to go and live alone in the forest. Learn how to deal with the various kinds of physical hardships, but also the mental hardships. You have to learn how to live with yourself. And by doing so, you understand how the mind is something which is completely conditioned. So, a monk who goes to live alone in the forest, who lives in seclusion, is in many ways the ideal of the Buddha's teaching. As long as monks will go to live in seclusion, live alone in seclusion, and can practice the Buddha's teaching, the four Satipatthanas, this is the inspiring example for the Sangha of the present, but also the future. We think of monks such as uh, Mahagasapa from Buddha's time, maybe his verses, we think of monks like Sariputta as learning. And then you know, we know the Arahants, they're very inspiring. But then we think of a monk like Bhantinyana Deep in present time, his ability to live alone in the forest in seclusion, to be able to confront and understand his own mind. This is the ideal practice of a Buddhist monk uh, in Buddhist time and also in present time, and also a good example for the future. As long as monks are willing to go to live in seclusion in the forest, they set an example. Unfortunately, nowadays, we find that many monks living like in a village monastery or study monastery, they may be good monks, but that's not actually a good example. That's not going, going to be an example of how to actually attain to the Buddha's uh, uh, goals and uh, to attain to Nibbana. We find monks who are living in monasteries, forest monasteries, that's also very wonderful training. 
However, if you live in a forest monastery, you can do very good practice. You, uh, also, there's no doubt you can become Aryan or even high Aryan. But you're still bound by living in company. You're still bound by society, among society. You haven't taken that extra step of going outside the special community and learning to live alone in seclusion. Living in seclusion is still the ideal practice. It's the best example. The Buddha has praised, if a monk will live in seclusion, this is the best example for monks, because you can't live in seclusion without developing yourself. You can't. There's no distractions. You have to get to know your own mind. Maybe the mind will start to, to um, get involved in different kinds of thoughts and all these things. All those kinds of thoughts and mental fabrications, if they're not understood, they would take you out of seclusion, out of the forest, back to society. Living in seclusion is the example for the Sangha who wants to progress in Dhamma, to, who wants to attain to what the Buddha was teaching, the goals of Buddhism. You have to get to understand your own mind. You have to learn how the, to let go of thoughts. You have to get to know how the mind is something which is completely conditioned, without any substance, just arising and passing away which is the true meaning of the first noble truth, and the me meaning of dukkha. Our body and mind is dukkha. We have to understand it, have to comprehend it, that. That's a goal of a meditation monk. Having, having understood the first noble truth of dukkha, suffering, how this body and mind is impermanent, suffering or unsatisfactory, subject to change, subject to becoming otherwise, is empty of any self, insubstantial, just something which is constructed, then by doing so one will also, by understanding that dukkha is suffering, will also understand the goal, the freedom of suffering. That is what Bhantir Nyaradipa offered. His contribution was showing this life of living in the forest ideal a living in seclusion. It's hard to find monks living that way anymore. But Bhantir was the one who has actually been the good example and has actually been the example for other monks to follow in his footsteps. We're talking about the very height, the very fundamental practice of being a bhikkhu, the one who can live in the forest alone and be completely happy, content, able to endure any kind of difficulties with equanimity. And of course, the greatest, greatest difficulty is your own mind. This is the wonderful contribution Bhantinyana Deepa has done for the forest monks in Sri Lanka. I guess also for the Buddhist world. I'm not saying that Bhantinyana Deepa is 100% perfect. I'm not saying that. I'm saying he's a good example. Someone who contributed a lot to the Buddha Sasana. In the 50 wasa he had, 50 wasa is a bhikkhu, two years as a samanir, 52 years in robes. He was a very inspiring example for Sangha and for lay people something that, you know, is a good example. We will maybe in future forget to some degree, you know, there's going to be books written about Bhante's lifestyle. We've had one or two other very inspiring Western monks in Sri Lanka. We're talking about Bhante Jnana, Jnana Deepa, but there's one before him called Venal Jnana Vimala. Remarkable, remarkable. Inspiration. Bhantinyana Vimala was able, continuous jarika, wandering apart from during the Vaskalia. 
he ha had almost no possessions whatsoever. He could endure any kind of hardness. Very strong mentally and was a great inspiration. He was a wandering monk, but he did not know how to live in the forest. Bhante Nyanawima could live without any kind of support, basically. This incredible freedom of wandering and fewness of wishes. A wonderful example for other foreign monks and also for the uh, Srinakan monks who want to follow his tradition. But he wasn't a forest monk. Bhante Nyanadipa is different. He was one who actually learned how to live in the forest and was a good example for other monks to follow. So we've had a number of very wonderful Western monks who are good examples for the forest Sangha in Sri Lanka. We are very fortunate to have them. And we can follow in their footsteps. Fortunately, I met both Bhantinyana Wimala and also Bhantinyana Tipa. Both of them have been very inspiring uh, for me as monks, but we also must find our own way. We're all different, so we know, must know what is suitable for our own practice. But at least we've had at least these two wonderful examples of practice monks, Vinodhyana Wimala and this one very inspiring monk who's just recently passed away called Vinodhyana Deepa. They've made major contribution for practicing monks. Have they attained to Nibbana? We just need that as a question. But their way of practice is one who has attained to Nibbana. To get updated with valuable Dhamma knowledge, subscribe and share the Samma TV channel today.